All right, all right. Turn to the Bible. If you're prophetic, you know where. If you're pathetic, I'll tell you. It is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. We're going to dive in the Word. Maybe it's the smoke up here that's making me feel different, you know? Ever since you guys started partying, like it's just getting weird up here. Matthew 6, 33, if they've got it, it'll be up. NIV version says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all things will be given to you, all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Um, Who in here has trouble focusing? Raise your hand. Nice. Um, Does anybody have trouble staying on task? Right. Um, How many of you guys are hyper-focused, like you're on it and you're not wavering from whatever that is? Anybody? Cool. So like when you drive down the road, are you thinking like, Stay between the lines, right? Everybody's got a little bit of attention problems, right? I was driving the other day, and I'm just seeing this big billboard flashing, right? And it always makes me think when you're driving, like, um, you're driving down the road, or maybe it could be for, like, two hours, and then all of a sudden you're just where you're going, but you don't remember, like, thinking about the driving process. You were just thinking about other stuff. And it's crazy how you can go on cruise control but still get to the destination, Um, So everybody's got a little bit of attention span issues because nobody's driving a two-hour trip and thinking about pulling in that one place the entire two hours. You've got to think about something else at some point, right? Amen. How many guys, though, in your faith walk, sometimes you, you like, know where to go, what to do, how to approach things. You know when to pray, when, when, when to, like, uh, dive into the Lord or just be with the Lord. You know, like, how to respond to conflict. You know when to repent. You know, like, some of those basic Christian principles and things that we do, but you have trouble staying on task. Anybody? Not, not me. I love verses that are so simple and so so uh, how do I say mysteriously leaving a lot of things out like seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added and I don't want to get into all these things you can fill in the blank however I think that's talking a lot about the fruit and the quality of life that Jesus paid for um, and then I see sometimes how we get so like stressed out in our faith or we get so burdened by trying to produce and produce and produce and be what we're supposed to be for God or whatever that it almost becomes counterproductive and we feel less than. And, and, and oftentimes I feel like rather than have fruit show up in our life, we're actually going the other direction because we're trying so hard to produce something. Sometimes it's righteousness, right? And how many of you guys know that you can't do that? Only Jesus could do that. So I said, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, meaning not yours, right? Meaning you'll never be good enough, so don't try to earn your salvation. Just figure out the salvation he gave you, because when you can really learn to receive the gift of God, it modifies how you respond and how you behave without you having to try so hard. Amen? Sometimes we're so stressed out trying to be good Christians that we can't be good Christians, right? You're so stressed out, you can't be nice to anybody, right? Mm. Seek first the kingdom, all these things will be added. I have huge problems staying on task, and if I do get on task, I'm hyper-focused usually, Um, but it's like it takes me about 100 tries to find that one thing that's going to keep my attention. Kara kept my attention, I do have to say that, Um, so that I can get, you know, like some points. (sighs) Praise God. Amen. (laughs) Praise God. Um, But sometimes it's hard to seek first the kingdom when there's distractions, right? And to kind of spring off what we talked about last week, and this is where I want to go this morning, the enemy can't change what God says, right? But what the enemy tries to do is change the way you hear what God says. 
He tries to sneak in. And so if I could put it this way, sometimes we're driving on this like awesome path, God's good, and we're in that zone, and the enemy's got billboards all over the place trying to get your attention, right? Sometimes those billboards are different things. Sometimes it's conflict. Sometimes like you ever get upset about things that are absolutely petty and stupid? Right, yeah? And then you go through maybe the rest of the day if you're a good believer and think, man, gosh, I just like missed the mark today on like how I responded, you know? Like, and then you feel bad, right? You know? You're not, not condemnation. You just feel heavy. You're just kind of down like, oh, I'm a failure, right? Because then you're like, man, I'm just not, I'm not good enough, you know? You know, when we take on that Eeyore spirit, that's exactly where the enemy is trying to get you. And if the enemy can get you there long enough, it will become your posture. And if it becomes your posture, it becomes your culture. If it becomes your culture, it becomes your response, and you no longer have to think about it. And just like driving to a destination, you can walk this kind of life out every day without having to try. You know what the cross did, though? The cross came and paid for something. He said, if you seek this first in his righteousness, these things will be added. In other words, you don't, you don't drive to that destination that Jesus paid for and have to figure out everything on the way. He just says, keep going, right? Because the truth is, we all have issues. We all have problems. We all miss the mark. We all mess up different days. We all get mad about stupid stuff. We all have relationships that need to be mended or uh, just various things in life that are just like struggling, you know? But the beauty is the blood's bigger than all the struggles. It says it doesn't matter how long it takes or how messy it is. I'm willing to go with you on the journey because I'm God and my grace is sufficient, right? But the enemy, ping, right? Driving like, man, God is so good. Whoa. There's a Chick-fil-A at exit four, right? That's what we do, right? You're not, you weren't even hungry. Then you saw the sign, and it triggered that, like, brain chemistry that reminded you of the smell of Chick-fil-A, and all of a sudden, there's chicken in the car, right? You weren't even hungry, but because somebody sold it to you, <clears throat> tastes good, right? See, the enemy's like this annoying thing, and um, I do want to, he's not here this morning. I don't know if Kim, is Kim here? I don't think so, but... Do keep Gary Moore in your prayers. He uh, had a foot surgery a couple weeks ago and will be down for the count for a little bit. Um, I told him to stop doing karate, but he did not. Um, but I'm going to talk about him this morning. I'm going to let him know. I'll, t- I'll text him after this. Because I know Gary's sitting at home right now on the Home Shopping Network. That's what he does, right? He, he lives for that stuff. And if you ever get on the Home Shopping Network or like infomercial stuff, I'm going to tell you a couple stories. One of the most annoying things that we fall for, and we do fall for it in some form, this, I'll, I'll talk in terms of products this morning, is people selling you stuff and promising results. Okay? Now, here's one. Here's a Christian one that I didn't fall for. I actually shouldn't have done this. I don't support anybody messing with people's ministries. Um, But years ago, um, when I was, like, much younger, right, there was this televangelist guy on TV, and he was selling. uh, He wasn't selling. Let me clarify. He wasn't saying he was selling something. Okay? No. Here's what was happening. He said, if you call the number, we're going to send you this anointed green prayer cloth. Okay. Now, if if you're into that, more power to you, but stop it. (laughs) Because in Jesus' name, there's no one more anointed than the Holy Spirit of God in you. you. You're definitely not going to get breakthrough from a rag if you can't get it from the Holy Spirit. Amen. So anyway, I'm thinking this guy is just a shyster. You know, like, and, and I, I wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't, I was just bored, you know. So I'm thinking, I'm going to call this guy. And of course, it wasn't going to be him, it was going to be like whatever. And we call, and it's like a, I don't remember if it was a person or a message or what. And, um, no, it was, a, it was an automated thing, right? Because I wanted to just challenge somebody. I was in the mood to like pick a fight, I didn't know any better. And early disciple days, you know. Call it, and they're like, ask him for my name, and. Me and a buddy were at the house doing this, and it's like, what's your, uh, 
last name, and of course I'm not giving him my real information, right? Because I don't want to be like smitten by the Lord. I want to trick him, you know, and let him know. So like, what's your last name? I'm like, Chop, right? I said, Chop, like Karate Chop, right? And they're like, what's your first name? I said, Lamb, right? <laughs> so we go on. I, give, I do give him my real address because I wanted to, to try out this anointed prayer cloth. And we're just like messing with the whole system, right? No joke, about three weeks later, here comes the mailman. And in the mailman's hand was this awesome envelope addressed to Lamb Chop. <laughs> Inside that envelope was this awesome green cloth, right? With that green cloth, because here's, here's what's sold with the cloth, by the way is if you get this, then whatever your struggle, your ailment, your, your, your insufficiency is, this is going to help be the thing that solves it, right? They're going to anoint it, you know, throw it on your head, and everything's going to be better, right? So I get it, take it out of the envelope, and I'm thinking, this is the anointed prayer cloth. And then I read the fine print, which wasn't fine. You just had to open up the letter that wasn't on TV. And this letter says, now here's the next step. I'm like, yes, right? The next step is you've got to send your seed of X amount into us back with the cloth. And then we'll pray over it and anoint it and send it back to you. Well, no, 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 let's hear them out. It's a good deal, right? Neil said, I didn't do that, right? But it makes me wonder how many people fall who are desperate, who are needing something, who get their hopes up. They get that cloth and they got just close enough to think, oh man, I'm almost to my breakthrough way. I've got this one more step I need to send in 50 bucks. And then they'll anoint it, send it back to me. And this thing I've been battling can finally go away when they get the lamb chop cloth back, right? Here's another one um, that was in my formative years. This one was probably, I was more excited about this one. So like, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, your body's going through changes, right? And with those changes, some, some of us went through this. Some of you guys look great your whole life. Some of us went through this phase where uh, uh, your face turned into a Domino's pizza place, right? <laughs> so I had that going on a little bit, you know. And I remember seeing these commercials for this product that if you buy it, wash your face with it, acne is going to go away, right? And what tricks you, here's what's hard about what people sell is there's testimonies, right? There's like somebody said, oh, it worked for me, and I'm, a, I'm amazing. And it'd always be like somebody famous half the time, right? And you know they didn't struggle with it. Um, <laughs> but they got them, you know? So I, we get this like stuff, my mom buys it, and I'm like, you know, I mean, you're embarrassed to go to school. I mean, kind of, I mean, you're kind of, I mean, like, it's kind of a blessing because most girls like a little bit of, you know, mountainous region going on. <laughs> but you're like embarrassed to go to school and interact with people. I mean, it's like you're, it's just kind of like, uh-uh, hide my face, you know? Because when you got blemishes, you're trying to hide them, right? So I order this miraculous solution with a certain chemical, and if I just do these steps, my skin's going to clear up, right? Order it, I'm excited, right? Because I'm thinking, man, like all this like puberty age is about to just get slapped in the face. I'm just going to look like awesome, you know, like in, a, in like a week at school. A few weeks go by, still, still in it, you know? few months go by still using the product but not seeing the results you know and you're always reading like okay like just try, give it a little bit longer for the product to work finally gave up on that product because I saw another commercial there was this new product out right and their whole approach was this is a different uh agent that we put in here that other you've heard the co competitor's stuff it doesn't work ours works here's the testimonies and they got like some famous person I'm like, wow, they, it worked for them, yeah. Order that. I'm thinking, all right, this is it. I got the wrong stuff. Had the wrong stuff. Try to use it. Little did I know, sometimes things just go away 
as we grow, and a product won't take care of it, okay? Sometimes time is the only thing that has its process, and you can't speed up certain things that are just going to happen. Now, nobody wanted to talk about the Oreos and pizza and soda I was eating and drinking every single day. That probably would have helped a little bit. Um, But I wanted the quick solution. We thought that's how it works, right? That's the world that we live in. And you know, half the time when you buy those products and it promises this crazy result, you don't get the result, you can usually read into it a little bit more and realize, I cannot tell you, go down the vitamin aisle, okay? And read the labels that have a specific result on it. And maybe it's like to improve your focus, or maybe it's to improve your, uh, your, your weight, or maybe it's to improve whatever. Take that little focus uh, vitamin bottle, all natural, by the way. Look on the back and compare it to just a, another vitamin supplement. What you'll see is nine times out of ten, it's the exact same stuff, just has a different label. It's just vitamins or a couple of herbal supplements or something, right? But they, but they sell it as if it's going to give you results, yada, yada. But in fine print, it says, we make no claim. Blah, this is not, I don't, I don't know how they word it, but it's a lie. But people buy it, right? We buy it. We get excited. We get hopeful because products that promise result feed off of people who are usually desperate for something, right? People who are in pain. How many uh, prescription pill commercials you see on TV these days, right? And it's got that one guy who's hurt, and they're like, oh, it worked for me. I mean, dude couldn't walk, and all of a sudden he'll be like hang gliding in the next scene, you know? And it's like, and I'm not saying that won't work for people. I'm all for uh, whatever works. But those products sell to people who either have some kind of pain, and usually when somebody's dealt with pain, they start to get tired, and they get exhausted, And when we're tired, we just want a fix. We need a solution. We're tired of fighting. We're tired of kind of swimming upstream. We just need something to take care of this already because we're too stressed out with the same thing we've always dealt with. Would somebody just sell me some magic formula to get this off of my face? Right? And we get it, and it doesn't work, and disappointment compounds. And when we started out like this, we took enough of a hopeful breath with this new product, 30 to 60 days, 90 days go by, it doesn't work, and now we've got a double portion of the disappointment that was there. And before we know it, we're walking through life like this because we tried every possible product we know of. See, the enemy can't change what God says, right? Right? And the enemy has no power, no power whatsoever. That's why he tries to feed off ours. He tries to trick you in to borrowing yours. He's smart. You know what the enemy is? I know he's a liar. I was waiting for somebody to say, liar. (laughs) The, The enemy has no power, but he's a good advertiser. Yeah? That's what he does. He advertises things. He advertises solutions that are a different way than the way of the cross. He advertises products that will give you a quick feeling rather than a sustainable identity. He'll advertise things that uh, advert, advertise, that advert you, that turn you towards something else than the path that you're on. So you're driving down that road and you've got pain or struggle and you've been through stuff. Maybe it's church life, maybe it's family life, maybe it's your marriage, but you're on that road to trying to fix it. And the truth is nothing can be exchanged for hard work. Hard work at the end of the day still wins in a lot of battles, amen? And the enemy shows up with that billboard and says, hey, here's something. This will give you relief over here, right? Let's give you relief. Like, get all those blemishes taken care of and send you this prayer hanky and, like, just life. I mean, you can pull that thing out anytime you want and just take care of business, right? But it doesn't work. 
And even sometimes it seems like we even stand on the word of God and it doesn't work. Now I know because of my faith and because of the word and because of what I believe about God that his word is true, it's powerful, and the word is not the issue. What he says is not nor ever will be the issue. The way I perceive it could quite possibly always be the issue though. Because it's somewhere on that destination of listening to God. The enemy's billboards start to advertise other things. Let's read this in Genesis. We looked at this last week. But this is what he does. And just say this to us, Genesis chapter 3, before we read this. Just to throw this out. If you notice when the enemy's doing stuff in life, it's, it's usually got the fruit of panic and urgency on it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, man, like some, like especially when there's crisis situation. Because something's going bad. It's like everything could derail or life's just, you're stressed out. And all of a sudden, you're like, you, you got to hurry up and get this fixed. And the enemy comes in. It's like, oh, here, here, here. I've got it. I've got it right here. Check it out. And because we're in that state of urgency, we're so quick to do it, you know? But God's not a God of anxiety. He's not a God of fear. He's not a God of missing it. There's, there's, there's no way that if you're resting in who God is and what he says over your life because of Calvary, there's no way you're going to miss the purpose of God if you're really following God. But the enemy will trick you into 6,000 billboards for different purposes and get you so entangled of trying to figure out which one's right that you forgot to even look at God through the process. Sometimes your purpose isn't the purpose. Sometimes your purpose is to keep looking at God. And if you can keep looking at God, all these things will be added because you sought him and his righteousness more than trying to figure out the mystery of your life, right? Right? The enemy advertises, though. He takes what God says and he messes with it. Genesis 3, 1 through 7 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, here's, here's, here's where it goes. Did God really say? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God really say this? The woman said to the serpent, we may, eat from, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. Right? So there's some mystery here. There's some unknown. There's some things that probably she doesn't understand, and the enemy knows that, and so he wants to fill in the blank because curiosity kills the cat, Right? I think it's fascinating, though, that he comes to the woman and not to the man. If you look at chronologically how creation unfolded, and I'm not going to draw a a theological absolute on this this morning, but um, even as I was reading reading it this morning, it's fascinating to me that God makes all of the stuff. He makes the man. He's made the garden. He's got the tree there, and he tells the man, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's after that commandment that he makes the woman. So in other words, I've got to assume because of how he laid it out that she wasn't even there for that conversation, which means she probably got that information from Adam. It was good information. It was the word of the Lord. Hey, here's how we roll, Eve. We can, like, we've got all of this, streams flowing in and out and trees, and you've got in the middle of that the tree of life, and then you've got the tree of the knowledge. All we've got to do is just don't eat anything from that one. Why, Adam? I don't know, just... Don't do it, all right? I mean, if anything, when you think the person who made you tells you something, you might want to try it out because they know something you don't, right? Because you weren't there before you, right? She shows up. She's curious. The enemy comes in that curiosity and says, did God really say, did he really put a limit, right? Let's keep reading. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. 
And here's what he does. He starts to advertise. He starts to advert. He starts to turn her toward a different way of seeing it. You will not certainly die. You're not going to die, you know. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Wow. Salesman right here, right? You know what the best products that you don't need are? The ones that they created the need for and then sold it to you. She had everything she needed. They were in bliss. They were made in the image of God. And he just created something to sell her. Fascinating. Smart. Even though he's a jerk, I will give him credit. He's a good salesman. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. Now, how did she see that? She didn't see that based on the word of the Lord. She didn't see that on the path of following the word of the Lord. She saw that by the manipulation of how the enemy made her relook at what God had already said. And she starts to look at it and think, man, yeah, that is kind of nice, right? You ever tell your kids don't do something? Yeah, and then they look at him like, wait a minute, that is kind of nice, right? That's kind of what I want to do now. Why? Because the Bible says that when the law is preached, sin revives and we die. In other words, like, when, when, when we, this is why they could never keep the law and Jesus had to come, because as long as that line was there, we were always going to be tempted by it, and no one was strong enough not to cross it except Jesus. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Oh, my gosh, now it's all I can think about, Right? We were in a staff meeting the other night, and I had this, like, thought come in my head. I was about to say it, and then I lost it. You ever have that happen? Yeah. Drives me crazy, but it happens so much to me now. I just, I, I enjoy it. <laughs> Everybody at the table was like, what was it? I was like, I don't know. And they look at me, no, you got to figure it out. What was it? Somebody said, it looked like it was going to be good. <laughs> have no idea. And still to this day, we don't know what it was. So I leave it with Jesus, right? But it's fascinating, though, when there's something you can't have, it makes you all the more want to know what's on the other side of mystery, right? Which can be a good thing when God's on the other side of our mystery, right? When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she doesn't know that. She doesn't experience, she doesn't even know anybody that's eaten from the tree. All she's doing is getting some infomercial byproduct of some devil who came and said he knows all this stuff, but he hasn't even eaten in front of her. She has no experience. I mean, come on, there's no Amazon review on the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? But all of a sudden, she's knowing like, hey, if I eat this, that fruit is going to make me smart, right? It's like smart water. I fell for it. I fall for it every week thinking it's going to work and I'm back to Aquafina. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now here's the interjection part is I want to know like if he was with her where where what, what was he not saying, you know, like you, at some point you, sh- you should have said something, right? So everybody wants to blame it on Eve for the sin, but he didn't speak up. Mm-hmm. And he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, previously, the Bible says that they were naked and they had no shame. Now, all of a sudden, they're in this posture. They did the thing that they weren't supposed to do because some billboard advertised it very cleverly, said, hey, you've got a need. Here is the product. It's going to work. And they ate it, and it did not work whatsoever. It opened their eyes, but it opened their eyes to something that wasn't like God. It opened their eyes to things that started to decay. It opened their eyes to the fact that they were vulnerable now, where it never bothered them before. Now all of a sudden they felt the subconscious need and conscious need to cover everything up. God comes in who was relationally always there and they feel like they've got to hide. They're ashamed. 
right? And it was never because the word of God wasn't good. It was because there's an advertisement that we buy sometimes, right? I think it's fascinating that after they started using the enemy's product, which was this fruit, they felt the need and would always from that moment on feel the need to cover. Yeah. Here's what bad products do. They sell it to you so that you need it and need it again and then need it again. Because no matter how many times I washed my face in that first 30 days, I did not look like Jonathan Taylor Thomas. (laughs) Anybody know who I'm talking about? Right? So I needed another 30 days. Then I needed another 30 days. Before you know it, you now have a monthly bill for a product that you never even used to know existed. Yeah, right? And what the enemy does is he comes in this awesome thing called salvation and he sows these awesome little uh, side products uh, mixed in with Jesus just enough so that we're like, God is good, we praise him, the blood is enough, his grace is enough, yet he can convince us through his billboard advertising every single day that even though the cross is good, is it really that good? Is it really good enough to pay for all the moments you don't feel like you measure up? Is it really that good that the days you're feeling unworthy, like is it really covering that or do you need to start fixing that? Is it really good for every moment I just miss it, you know, like I just respond that time you got upset at somebody? Is the cross really that good? And he starts to have that cool advertisement play on your feed and you start to buy into it and you start to uh, sink down a little bit. You think, oh my gosh. See, there's people here this morning who even come into church, you feel two-faced. And you need to know that's the enemy. That's not God. God doesn't want you to come into an atmosphere of celebrating his goodness and his cross thinking that you're a hypocrite. Even if you did whatever you did, you've got to stop living life based on what you've done and start living it based on what he's done so that it can transform what you do. Amen? But the enemy wants you to buy that product and then you're going to need it again, right? They started making clothes. They were so vulnerable, right? See, here's here's what happens, unfortunately. The, The gospel is way too good to be true. Amen? It's the only product that if there was a infomercial, that would be 100% true. Crazy, right? But because we've been disappointed so many times, it's hard for us to fully dive in and embrace everything that one statement involves. Because what I do believe is the Bible's clear and does promise results when we follow Jesus. It does promise results when we're under the blood. It does promise results when his spirit is inside of you. It does promise results if we just stay on task and stop buying every product along the way, thinking it's going to help get me there. He said, seek first the kingdom and all this stuff will be added. Meaning you don't need to stop and pay for what he already paid for the entire trip. Right? But the enemy sneaks in and says, is it really enough? It doesn't seem to be working today. My blemishes aren't gone yet. God, like, I know the cross is enough. It's not working yet. And so what we do is we think, oh, I need to try this other product that's got a different chemical. In other words, it's a different way, right? See, this this version is called performance religion, right? Right? where we take the cross of Jesus and then we add all of us to try to make it better. We don't know that we do it, right? But we take the cross and then we nail the Ten Commandments to it, not to say that it's fulfilled, but to observe it. And then we think, for some reason, that we can pull all of these weird uh, pressures and laws and things and burdens and put on our life and somehow perform that. Not knowing that it's Christ in you who's strong enough to transform your actions the way you think, the desires of your heart. He's the one who can modify everything to where you don't want the thing that you used to want. So you don't have to think about it every day and think, stay in the line, stay in the lines, two hours to go, right? He's the one who shows up and gets you thinking about 
a different thing, yeah? I don't, I don't want to do things that I used to do, not because I conquered them, but because he conquered them and I saw him do it by observing him, yeah? But performance religion is that product that the enemy came up with. It's clever, right? Performance religion's the, now I know the, the green prayer cloth's up there, but performance religion is the greatest scam of all time. You know what the enemy has right now? And I, I don't, I, we hardly ever talk about the enemy in this church. If you're visiting today, um, just want you to know that because he doesn't deserve any glory. Um, but you know what he, he has in this hour? Advertising. That's it. You know what his goal is? See, look at the pattern of what he did with Eve. God made this commandment, right? And then he made Eve. The two were one. The one were two. It was awesome, right? Marriage. <laughs> the enemy slips in, and this is what he does. And sometimes he uses the word of God to do it, right? He's always going to bring you back to what the word says. It's the only thing that he can go to, right? It's the thing that plagues him. He says, did God really say, what's happening? The information she got probably came from him. Who knows? I mean, she wasn't there for the original conversation. Maybe they met up after that and talked about it. I don't know. But not only did she start to question God, but probably in that started to question her husband, right? Because he's probably like following this rule, like don't eat this. God said don't do it. What, what that reveals is that when the enemy's selling you something, those scammy products, they always want to pull you aside and make you feel isolated like you're the only one that's got this issue. And if you could get it fixed, you could be out running like everybody else. You could be hang gliding like who in the world's out hang gliding every week? Like a couple people, you know? But they sell you this picturesque life where the sky's the limit. And we fall for it, not realizing that with life in God, the sky's already limitless, you know? There's no boundary in my life with him. Why would I sell out for a life that has a boundary? He's a good salesman. That's why. Because he gets you on those days you feel down and don't feel like super Christian, right? You show on that day, you're like, man, I feel like super not Christian right now. And that's when he slips in and says, it's not working. It's not working. See, that's not working. You try a different church, right? You try a different church because they've got a different chemical. And you've tried 30, 60, 90 days here, and it's not, I mean, you still got the blemishes, right? But the truth is we need to have churches where people can have blemishes and stop being afraid or ashamed of that, you know? See, people who skip, around churches thinking that it's the answer are, are, are product buyers. They think that the next thing is going to solve the problem that at the end of the day is them. Well, I'm not getting my fruit. Well, maybe you're not fruitful, you know? Do you ever think? Well, I need like this new, that next book. I need that next, nothing wrong with some of this stuff, by the way, except for hopping around churches. And prayer hankies, don't, just don't stop that. If you go buy one, buy one from me, because I'll sell it to you. <sighs> Mine are more expensive, but better quality. Cashmere. Um, <clears throat> when, when we have everything we could ever need based on the righteousness of Jesus, the enemy's main goal in this current age, is to distract you from walking out what that looks like. He wants you so distracted that you're frustrated and so frustrated that you can't function and so dysfunctional that you start to divide. Because that's what he was doing. He's saying, you know, did God really say? And he's slowly luring her in away from unity to make her feel just enough isolated that she feels like she needs something. 
He says, here's the deal, like, eat this, and you're going you're gonna to be like God. And God knows that. This is just what they won't tell you. Sounds like a commercial, right? I'm like, here's what the drugstores won't tell you. If you eat this one plant leaf, you will never be sick again. Right? It's good, good salesman. She says, oh, maybe I do need that. Maybe I do need a commercial vacuum cleaner that could suck my car through the hose and throw it 50 yards because I know there's hair deep down the surface that no other vacuum can get to and no man has seen before. Of course I need that. It's only practical and logical. I don't care if it's $59,000. Finance it at 15% interest. It's okay. I have to have it and I need it now. That's what he does. He tricks us into giving everything we've got into a product that has zero results, burns you out, and you're addicted to it and always trying to find that next solution to make you feel happy. But real contentness and joy are only going to come when God is enough for your life and not all of these things. Amen? He doesn't want you to buy that though, right? Because then he doesn't have anybody to talk to. You know, you know that's the problem with messed up people is they don't like to be alone, usually. They need somebody else to hurt with them. Yeah. That's what he's like. He's broken, you know. And he's just looking for somebody to have a conversation with. That's all he's got. People say, man, the devil hit me in the leg and it's hurting today. No, he didn't. But he's going to let you think that he did so that you give him glory for it. You know? You know what I'm saying? We trip, hit the coffee table, stub our toe. We're like, man, the devil's attacking me. No, you tripped. (laughs) And you hit the coffee table. And it hurt. Right? And then we blame the devil and the devil gets praise. For something that he can't create. Because from the beginning of it all, he always wanted to be the creator. He can't change what the creator's done, and that drives him crazy. So he tries to manipulate the way that you perceive it. So if you can give him glory for hitting that toe, praise God. Right? All he has is advertising, marketing, streaming all around us. You know what else is all around us? The goodness of God. The spirit of God. We sang it this morning. He's above, he's below, he's over here. He's he's everywhere. Meaning no matter where you turn, even if it's behind those fig leaves, trying to cover up those blemishes that you think are keeping you from some uh, like superior, superior level of Christianity. Guess what? It may be that the fruit of your Christianity only shows up when you are secure enough to carry that stuff, but carry it to the throne of grace, not try to fix it first. When he said come boldly, that's for people who have stuff to bring. In other words, he's encouraging you, hey, don't don't dare think that whatever mess you've got is too unclean for this area. See, the whole system before that and the covenant they were in was nobody can come back here. Just the high priest going to go back here once a year, make atonement. Nobody else is worthy. It developed this isolation and division and tribe mentality, and that's what they knew, and that's what the world suffers from still is this place where we all want to divide and figure out who's got what and who's got what I need and who's selling this. And God's just looking for people says, you know what, we are all messed up. But praise be to God that he's not. And I get to tag that on my name because of his goodness. I get to stand in the righteousness of Jesus because of him. So I don't have to get up every day and feel like i got to prove myself to God. No. That's hard for people, though, because we want to be all that we can be, and that's great. I mean, get up and try to, like, go for it. Absolutely go for it. But, but when you realize that you're you, 
don't dare let you disqualify the him that is in you. Amen. 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 Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I don't think that's just talking about the devil who's out here. I think it's talking about the you that's in the world. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Guess who the he is in this world? It's me. And the one who stumps me every day isn't the devil. It's me. Amen? And I've got to remember every single day that his grace is sufficient for me that's in the world, messed up, but trying to do it. You know, I mean, you know, does that make sense? See, last, last couple thoughts and we're done because they're kicking me out. <laughs> Matthew 6 This time, starting in verse 28, it says, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, or here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? This is fascinating to me. So do not worry, okay? So, so right here's the context. This is the atmosphere. This is the, this is the breeding ground of what life with God is like. And it's hard because it's vulnerable, you know what one of the hardest things to do is? Is to, is to get with, with God and, and really try to get to that place where you're not stressing out about all this stuff around us. Anybody find that hard? That's what he's saying to do, though. That's what life with God is like. When you know that you're, you're getting closer is when you're in that place where you're not consumed by all the stuff God doesn't seem to be doing. You're content with what he's done. Amen? So do not worry saying, what shall I eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. He's not saying you can't go to the mall, right? He's saying stop trying to find you and all the stuff. Stop buying all the products that you think make you up. Stop eating that fruit. And here's the most dangerous fruit of all. It's the side of the tree that usually doesn't get talked about because we know that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has two sides, and it's easy to tell people, don't do bad stuff. Obvious, right? Enemy doesn't even care about hooking you with that right now. He wants to hook you with the good side of the tree, the side of the tree that looks like Christianity, but it burns you out to the point. You don't have the energy to even be excited about God. It's the side of the tree that says God is good, but he wasn't good enough, so you need this as an add-on. And if you could just figure out your purpose, Benita, we'd get you there. Will, if you could just get this one side, Will, if you could just start speaking in tongues, you'd have it all. And he, he uses God's stuff and tries to sell it to you. He's a middleman when we don't need one, Right? I think it's fascinating that the Bible says him and the angel were fighting over the body of Moses. Who was Moses? He was the mediator between God and man. He was the one who had that covenant of the law because the enemy wanted to be in that position where he could hold something over somebody else. Even though he could never create it for himself, he wanted glory. He wanted to be able to manipulate, right? So the first issue was that the enemy comes and he advertises something and where they didn't have to wear clothes before, now all of a sudden they have to put clothes on every day because they don't feel like they could be the way they were. It's uncomfortable now. I don't, I don't want people to see who I really am. You know? I'm afraid, like, this is great, but if, if people come to my house or they see me in road rage hour on uh, uh, traffic, they're going to see the real me, and, and people come to church feeling like two-faced, and then the enemy starts to wear that down, and you feel like you're not good enough, so people quit coming. They quit fellowshipping, and he divides, and Jesus is somewhere in the middle just saying, hello, did you not see the part where I paid for all that mess? Take a breath, you know? 
But Matthew says, and why do you worry about clothes? So I think he's speaking even a lot deeper to the heart of man and the root here. I think he's speaking prophetically all the way back to Genesis saying, hey, you woman who fell, who bought the product, it didn't work, it caused suffering on your life, and it was expensive. And you've been using it ever since trying to get yourself in a posture of self-acceptance. Why do you worry about clothes? Look at the flowers. You know where flowers grow in a garden? He's trying to reconnect a thing that was disconnected, the place where God and man were divided. He's trying to lead them back into. That's what the cross did. It doesn't make sense. It hasn't caught our understanding. It doesn't show up every day in our lives on the scale that we would like, but we have to trust that his grace is sufficient and be willing just to keep trying even when we fail. See the flowers? In other words, wake up. Because for, before you ever got in this context of severe brokenness, you were made to be in his likeness in a place where everything was provided, everything was taken care of. I'll tell you that Solomon didn't even dress like this. And if that's how God clothes the grass, that literally is here and gone and comes the next year. And How much more does God value you? Do you not think the security that causes the sun to come up every single day and not miss a beat, not one time in history, has the sun not been the sun? No matter where it was in the sky, there's not one time where it just ceased to exist. You might not have been able to see it, but it was there. And if our God is so secure in the things that he makes that they're that strong, that consistent, why is it that we forget he made all these things and then made us to steward them for relationship? but we have this underlying feeling that he just tolerates us. Doesn't really like us, but he loves us. Just doesn't like us. That's not God. That's a billboard. Yeah? Verse 31, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Not yours. Seek first his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Amen. Amen.